22 years. I took in drug-induced babies, alcohol-induced babies. I had some long-term care of children. What people who use drugs, women and men have an effect on them too, due to these children, is so immoral. The children I had, especially one of the little boys who eventually got adopted, after 10 years I spent with him, he will never be right. His sister, his brother will never be normal. One of them has major physical problems. They will never marry, they will never have children. Probably they will never have a job because their nervous systems are so upset or so, uh, so abnormal. I had a little baby girl that I had for six months. She was alcohol induced when she was born. She, uh, the woman who I knew the mother, had three other children, they were all taken away, all four of the children, they were adopted out. These children all had problems, because I knew them, because I was in the system so long that I knew what happened to different children. I don't think the courts are hard enough on some of these people. These women, don't they realize what they have done? The burden they have made their children carry for the rest of their lives not to have a normal life. And then I have people up here objecting with this gentleman back there. God, they should be ashamed. I'd just like to say a couple of comments that, about what these commission figures tell me. I see the participant count in Jim Doyle's program dropping by like 500 people. And over here, the number going to prison is also dropping. Now that tells me that those people are out on the street. Now you don't get arrested for a felony, generally, until your drug habit exceeds about $2,000 a day. Up to that point, a, a drug addict can shoplift enough to, to meet his needs. They get arrested for robbery or something, a felony crime, then they get on this list. But those 500 people out on the street have habits that are exceeding $2,000 a day. You're talking about drug sales of a million dollars a day difference in that chart. And we are bearing the cost of all those crimes. Hello, I'm Donna Johnston, and I would not have come to speak had not my son agreed to speak. He came here uh, willingly. Uh, there was no mandate, or I had no expectation on him to speak, and I thought I would keep silent. Uh, but if he chooses to speak, then I will follow him. Um, as far as there being a bias, uh, there is no bias on my part. There is just personal experience. There is just witnessing the change in my son. There is watching him go from a sweet, uh, gentle-spirited, um, very agreeable, loving child to one that got belligerent and one that became dis deceitful and you could see the personality changing, you could see them begin to fail. And as a parent, um, I've learned that parenting is the most humbling job there will ever be. You go into it thinking that, uh, after all, I'm educated, I love these children, uh, I, know, I know right from wrong, and I will pass that to them, and yet they can slip out from under your grip so quickly. And uh, we would be about, here, when this program was so new and such a fledgling program, and I said, and I had no concept of an official uh, program. I just went to Judge Doyle, knowing him, the man, knowing his character, and said, I need some help. Uh, you know, Jesse, it, is, it was pot. It, it wasn't uh, the egregious uh, things that these young people are battling now. But I could see the the harm that was doing and how, again, as he relayed to you, he was barely getting out of his freshman year of high school, and I knew that it was, oh, it had gotten away from me, and I would so agree with you, sir, when you said that uh, when you would see Judge Doyle, the best time was when you were leaving him, when you were getting away from him. Understand for a certainty, my son was not happy to be in that program. He was not happy with me. He was not happy with Judge Doyle. There was no camaraderie there, and it was not a feel-good situation, but he respected him. And he obeyed, and he followed uh, the, uh, and, and again, 
Sometimes we wouldn't even speak there and back. He would be angry at me and, and uh, not a bit happy about being needed to be you know, accountable. Uh, one of the most powerful experiences, and um, Jesse, I'm going to speak for you because I will never forget it, is that one of the things he was required to do was go to the King County Corner and go to the morgue. And on the wall of the morgue were the lists of the deaths of that year, the name, the age, the place where the bodies were found, and he could identify his peers. He could identify some of the names of those young people, those tragic young people, as Mr. Page has written about, that didn't have to die. And he came home from that and um, said, and I won't share the name of the young man, but he said, Mom, I saw so-and-so's name on that list and it was life-changing for him, and I will never forget it. And he was also required to go to the Kane County Jail, and um, he couldn't wear any belt, he couldn't have his shoelaces on, he couldn't have a hat on, but he had to go sit across from some of those um, inmates and men that didn't have this chance, didn't have a drug court to keep them out of jail. And they sat down with these young people, and it was, uh, I think, scared straight, well, I think maybe there had been some scared straight programs, and it, he, he walked into the family room that night and he said, Mom, wash everything. Everything I have on, I'll never forget it. Everything I have on needs to be washed. But uh, I have also attended um, two of the funerals of his parents, <coughs> young people that have died from suicide and overdose because of the scourge, because of the addiction that drug is. And uh, it is so tragic and it is a problem. And uh, this is a program that is des desperately needed and a man that gave so much.